Welcome again to Resonate Jesus Church. It's so good to see so many of you. It is that time of the service where we're going to dismiss the kids. So, kids, if you want to go ahead and stand on up and head on out the back, uh, I'm sure that you guys are going to have a lot of fun. And uh, adults, if you want to open up, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. So, we are halfway through our season. Christmas is coming, preparing the way for the King of Kings and uh, getting ready for uh, uh, two uh, wonderful messages next Sunday. So last week, I asked you a question, and if you weren't here last week, I'm going to ask you that same question, and I'm not going to answer it for you. Uh, Rhetorical question. What do you think Jesus wants for Christmas this year? It's a question that I wrestle with from time to time to say, Lord, what do you want? What do you want this year for Christmas? Uh, We also looked at a little bit last week, um, cross-references. That is, when the Bible, using a theme or prophecy, references itself. How many times does that happen in the Scripture? And if you actually look at the bottom of the screen, if you see, those are the books of the Bible, and how many times they reference other parts of the Bible. It's actually, it's amazing when you think 63,779 cross-references and not one mistake. Um, We talked a little bit last week about how uh, just doing basic data entry for a a short amount of time and mistakes that can be made in data entry and how easy it is for us to make mistakes and God's word, there is no mistake. Uh, We talked specifically about prophecies in the Old Testament that directly reference the Messiah or Jesus coming into the New Testament and that there's 103 that I can see. Uh, There's probably a few more. In fact, people always are debating about which ones and, and if, if there's two parts to the prophecy and Jesus fulfills both parts, is it actually two prophecies or is it just one prophecy? We'll see a little bit of that today, but there's 101 of those. And we talked a little bit about Advent and the, the candle lighting and, and some of the liturgy of what formal churches do. And uh, we want to honor what, what churches do. And there's three things we're going to look at this Advent season. And the first one is the physical coming of Christ when he was uh, born of Mary. The second one we're going to highlight this week, which is Christ's messy picture amongst all of them. They all made it like, oh, as though angels just floated the baby down. I promise you, it was not like that. And uh, (laughs) they talk about a peaceful night, you know, the peaceful night of Jesus being there. It was probably a really rough night. How many of you parents, like the first night you had a baby, like the very first time, it was such a peaceful and glorious night and you slept through the night? Yeah, none of you. None of you are daring to put your hands up because, yeah, eh, Probably not a lot of sleeping. A child is born. A son is given. Isaiah is pointing us to the eternal son. He's pointing us to the mystery of the Trinity, that thing that theologians have wondered over and fought over. I mean, like fist fought over. Um, How is it that God can be both father and son and Holy Spirit? And how can he be three persons, yet one God? And if by the end of this, you know exactly how that works out, you tell me because then we can, uh, we can tell all the other, we've got it down. We know the teacup is our thinking and the mystery and the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of how big God is, is the ocean. It is so big and so great. Uh, if you've not thought about it this way, you can start learning about the Trinity right now and you can continue to learn about who Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is for all eternity and never fully have all of it down. A son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. That was one of the things that is, is promised here. And I, I thought and I struggled with this because when we look at, at human government, and we're not going to go too far down this road because we don't want to on Sunday morning look at human government too much, but there's so many flaws and mistakes. And our checks and balances sometimes work well and sometimes they just blow up in our face. The government will be upon his shoulder, upon Christ's shoulder. And, and as I was struggling with that idea of looking at imperfect government, uh, I was reminded uh, of this truth in Colossians. And I'll remind you of it so that you can be, have the same piece that I, I found this week. Colossians 1, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And so when we look at, at the imperfection that we have right now, and there's lots of imperfection that we can talk about later, and sometimes it's best that we not talk about all the imperfection that we have right now. But everything that exists, both visible and invisible, both physical and spiritual, everything that exists was created by Jesus. Let me say that again. 
Everything that has ever existed or will ever exist was created by Jesus. Is it a difficult thing to say that the government is on his shoulder? No, because he created all things. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And so as we think about that great and wonderful, profound mystery, he created all things, and he came to his own creation and put limitations upon himself, limited himself for a short amount of time so that he could take our place because he loved us. But his power, the power of Christ, literally holds all things together. I did this one other time this year. Forgive me for using it a second time, but I love it. It's one of my favorites. How many of you, when you came to the theater, you looked at your seat and you checked it to make sure that your seat was structurally sound before sitting down? How many of you did it? Come on, be honest. How many of you were like, let's make sure the bolts are in tight and make sure, like, when I sit down, I'm not going to go right through it. You didn't do it. You just trusted that your seat would hold you up. And on a molecular level, the entire universe is held together by the power of Christ. For Christ to for one moment, not hold something together, it would just vanish from existence. And if you think the nails that were driven through his hands and through his feet and all that excruciating pain, even the nails were being held together by his power. The power of Christ holds all atoms, all things together. He holds all things. The government is on his shoulders because all power and authority comes from him. Where we have trouble is what humans do with that power and authority. When, when sinful man who is broken and marred, still made in his image, uses the power and authority that comes from Christ, we use it imperfectly. There is no example of perfect government, just like there's no physical example of a perfect father other than the father that we have. Jesus, all authority rests on him and it all comes back to him. And his name will be called, I love this part, and this is something that we should dwell on and think on this week. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And as we think about who is Christ, and as I was thinking through this idea to say, Christ is not actually a name. I'm not sure that you didn't realize Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Jesus' last name isn't Christ. Christ is actually a title the anointed one, that, that Christ is the anointed one, and all of these titles also match with him. He is the definition of wonderful. There is nothing that matches wonderful more than Jesus. He is counselor, and being the eternal counselor, are you bringing your cares and your worries, your troubles and your fears, are you bringing them to your godly counselor? Are you telling him throughout the week the struggles and the failings and the difficulties and the triumphs? Are you sharing those things with him because he really is a counselor? He has that title to say he wants to have that counselor, counselee role with us in a very real way if you listen to him. Some of us have been in um, actual counseling with another human being. I, I'll, I'll put, don't raise your hand, but I'll put my name on that list. I've been in, in counseling with another human being because from time to time, we, we need it. We need someone to, to share things with. But how many times have people gone to a counselor and then received the exact answer and advice that they need and then turned around and not done it? How many times? It happens over and over and over and over again. Actually, yeah, I studied counseling. The first thing that I studied was psychology and counseling. That was my first field of study. And oftentimes, even with the perfect answer, people don't follow through. And so my encouragement uh, is get counseling with a physical counselor when you need it, absolutely. But let Jesus be your spiritual counselor every day, every moment. You have constant, immediate access to him. Wonderful that he is. Let him be your counselor today. He is mighty God. Jesus is not the Son as in diminished from God, lesser than God the Father. Jesus is mighty and God. He is fully God. And even though for a short time he played with those limitations, he did not ever stop being fully God. The scriptures don't teach that. He didn't uh, step down and give up his Godhead. He just limited himself for a short amount of time so that he could fulfill all righteousness on our behalf. This is the one that I struggled with the most this week as I was looking at this beautiful prophecy, Everlasting Father. This prophecy links us to who? 
to Jesus. And one of the, the things that I, I thought, wow, interesting that Jesus can also be like a father to us, as in having authority over, having protection, wanting to provide for. He is our everlasting father, prince of peace, something that our world is just desperate for, something that our world needs the, the prince of peace to reign, to rule and to reign. I just, there will come a time when Jesus has settled all accounts and there is perfect peace, something that, that is so far beyond our thinking, it's hard for us to even imagine what that would look like. I want you to take just a second. I want you, each of you to close your eyes. I'm going to wait for you to do it, unless you're, unless you're listening to this and driving a car. If you're driving a car, don't close your eyes because I know sometimes people listen while they drive. I, I do that sometimes. But close your eyes. I want you to imagine right now if every man, woman, child, and person on earth acknowledged Jesus as the Prince of Peace, laid down arms, and gave their lives to him. I want you to imagine the world that we would open our eyes to. Just imagine for one moment if we all acknowledged him as our Prince of Peace. Open your eyes. One day, we will see with our eyes that world. One day we will step into that glory where there is no longer sin, no war, no pain, no sorrow, and no regret. And I think it's that last one I think I struggle with the most. The others, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. But Jesus will, will absorb and take away from us even the regrets that we have, the things that we've struggled with all of our lives. All regret will fade when we're in the light of his glory and grace. He is wonderful. He wants to be your counselor. He is mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. This was fulfilled in his coming. We see it in several places, but the place I see it clear, most clearly is Matthew 1, 18 through 21. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then, her, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." The Son has come and lived a fully human life on our behalf already. Conceived of the Holy Spirit, not of, of a human lineage except for, uh, for Mary, but to say Jesus has come and was born and is coming again. I think that third part of the message to say, wow, can't wait for the moment when he comes and sets things right. Now, as I was preparing this message and as I was leaning into what the Holy Spirit wanted, I'm going to take you to Zechariah 9.9. It is a minor prophet, so unless you're doing it on your phone, you'll find it in a second. If you're in a paper Bible, which I love a paper Bible, you're like, where is it? Find it. It's in, in the minor prophets, not because of their stature, because of the length of the book. That's what we call minor, not because they you know, were digging with a pickaxe. Anyway, Zechariah 9.9. Yeah, it's probably the funniest we're going to get all day. So, sorry. Apologies in advance. So, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Another one of the beautiful prophecies that's hidden in the Old Testament that points us that Jesus is exactly who he said he is. Zechariah 9.9, talking about Jesus coming on a specific day. There was one specific day when Jesus wept over Jerusalem. You realize, why was Jesus, uh, something that is emotional enough to cause Jesus to weep, not just, not just one glistening tear, but like to cry tears and tears and tears. What is it that causes Jesus that kind of emotional, Missy, what is it that causes? Because the people did not believe he came not riding on a war horse, not coming to conquer and throw the Romans out on their ear, which is what the Jews in that day desperately wanted. They wanted the oppression of the, Jew, of the Romans gone. He came riding on a donkey in complete humility. And we see this fulfilled in Mark 11, 7 through 10. They brought a colt to Jesus and they threw their clothes on it 
and he sat on it. And many spread their, their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them over the road. Then those who went before followed, cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Before he rode in, his, we call this a triumphal entry because he is coming into Jerusalem. And as he enters the gates, he, there's two directions he can go. If he turns to the left, he's going to the temple, which we know he does do because we've read the story. We know that's where he's going. He enters into the temple and he turns left to, to go and to teach and to tell them that the time is finally here. If he turns to the right, he's going to the praetorium. Turn, turn right, turn right. They want him to overthrow Rome. That was their, their whole thinking. Their whole thinking in the first century was the Messiah is going to come and he is going to be the warrior with a sword and cut down our enemies. And he came humbly on a donkey. And the reason that we're looking at this prophecy that is fulfilled right here, already fulfilled in, in Mark, and you're thinking, how does this connect? They missed the coming of the king. They missed it. They, they had such expectations, they had expectations of what he was supposed to do that they missed the day of his coming. In the book of Daniel, it actually prophesies the exact day that this will take place to the day it prophesies. The prophecy is it's coming, 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 coming. On this day, the king will arrive. And the Jews missed it. And I don't want you and I to miss it. I don't want you to miss the real coming of the king because your expectations don't line up with who Jesus really is. And it got me to thinking of the stories of meeting Jesus. I found this beautiful uh, a picture. I, I, I put it in. I'm looking for, for free pictures of, of Jesus and the triumphal entry. And uh, I love this artist's renditions of it. And thinking of when was the moment that Jesus became real to you? And I want you to think about that moment. When was the moment where you said yes to him being Lord of your life? For me, it was 1986. Yes, I was three years old at the time. And my dad didn't even realize that I was old enough to understand the gospel, let alone to pray. He was actually giving the gospel presentation to my older brother. My, this was in France back in 1986. And so we had a very good French bread and uh, uh, wine with every meal. No, <laughs> in France, that is what they do. And he gave the gospel to my older brother, not realizing I was sitting right there. And when he asked my older brother, Stephen, do you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He carefully walked him through the gospel. Uh, Stephen said yes. And as he started to pray, he looked down and he didn't realize, but I was three years old at that time, holding on to his, his chair, praying the sinner's prayer, saying yes to Jesus. But that was, was my first moment of faith, of reaching out as a, as a three-year-old. I had a, enough awareness to say, I want Jesus. But it wasn't until I was about 12 years old that Jesus became real to me. And I want you to think about that moment. And if you can't pinpoint a moment when Jesus became real to you, it's possible. Um, I was so glad. Um, this morning during the worship set, we sang um, a song that you're probably familiar with, um, Hark the Herald Angel Sing. You didn't know there was a, an angel named Hark, did you? Hark, the, the angel. You didn't know that? There's an angel named Hark? No. Uh, did you, have you ever looked down at the bottom of the screen? That was my second joke, second and, and, and uh, brum, 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 brum. he's not actually, okay, never mind. We're not, we're not even going to try and explain the joke. It'll only get worse from here. If you look at the bottom of the screen, it gives you the information. Our CCLI license tells you who wrote that song. And you may be familiar, may not be familiar. Who, who wrote the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Who wrote that song? Charles Wesley. And Charles Wesley was the brother of John Wesley. And they had been around Jesus a whole bunch but it wasn't until there was one specific moment and it was after finally meeting Jesus face to face that Charles Wesley gave his life to Jesus. He, you can come to church for a long time and not be saved. Did you know that? You can be coming to church for years and not have given your life to Jesus. Charles Wesley got to this moment where, where Jesus said, you're either all in or you're not in at all. Which is it going to be? Jesus uh, uh, put the gauntlet before him. And it was after giving his life to Jesus that he wrote that hymn that we still sing today, Hark the Herald Angel Sing. I don't want you to meet your, your moment with Jesus 
And for those of us that that moment was a long time ago, it's been, so at three, I met him for the first time. At 12, he became real. At 16, I was baptized in the middle of winter. And uh, uh, all three of the baptisms that day were like less than five minutes for all three of them. The water was so cold. But it didn't matter how cold the water was because we wanted Jesus so much. It didn't matter. It, it, freezing cold temperatures, we were like, we'll do it. And so if someone wants to be baptized today, we'll go down to the river, we'll baptize you right now. <laughs> but don't wait. The point is, once you've said yes to Jesus, there's no longer any waiting, any delay. Don't put it off any further. Say yes to him right now. Jesus wept over the fact that the Jews had him physically in their presence and so many of them, even the ones that were laying things down, in the, laying down the palm fronds, laying down their jackets, would then later also cheer when he was crucified. They missed it. And I don't want you to miss it. You can come to church and you can do churchy things and you can give money. to the, You can do all sorts of good things and not have met Jesus yet. And so today our focus really is on meeting him face to face in faith. And if you have not received him yet, don't wait another day. Because not one of us is actually promised another day. We have no idea what the future will hold. And so our encouragement is to say, today is the day that we turn our life over to him. And for those of us that have been walking with him for all these years, uh, I was uh, rejoicing that for us, reaching out to him, really, the, the picture, some of you have noticed it already. Come on, no one's noticed it yet? <laughs> there you go. All right, some of you, I got it, yes. So, um, this is supposed to be the triumphal entry and the, the artist who rendered it. I'm, so we're going to say this is not the triumphal entry. And as I was looking at this picture, I thought, it's such a good picture. And it's one that I don't have to buy a license for, so I'm going to use it anyway. But I want to introduce you to one other meeting of Jesus right now, which is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wicked, awful, horrible, short little man. And I mean that, like literally, like the scriptures tell us, like he was little. And no one liked him. Everyone hated him. And he was of such short stature to even see Jesus. He had to climb into a sycamore fig tree to, to see Jesus. Jesus is coming to town. Yes. And does he cry out to Jesus by faith? And is he saved because he called out to Jesus? No. Go back to the story. Jesus goes to him and says, today I'm going to eat with you in your home. Now, even in our modern culture, typically we don't do that. I don't go up to someone and say, hey, guess what? Today I'm eating in your house. Like, we don't typically do that. Jesus was saying, I'm coming to you, Zacchaeus. And the interesting thing is the whole crowd murmurs and is unhappy that, that Jesus is going to be with this dirty, rotten, filthy, short little sinner. Like, how dare he? Salvation came to Zacchaeus because Jesus sought him out, not because of anything that he did, and not for certain that he did deserved anything. And we see his whole life changed the day that he met Jesus. And my, my heart is for you to know him. And for those of us that have been walking with him faithfully, you're like, this doesn't apply to me. I want to ask you, how well do you know him? Because you get to know him more and deeper and more. And for thinking back through the, the beginning list of the, the titles that he holds, wonderful and counselor and mighty God and everlasting father and prince of peace and each of those things, each of those titles gives us another dimension of the beauty of God that we get to know him. So if you're one of those believers, and I know we've got so many who have been uh, a believer for a long time, continue to press into knowing him and let him continue to change your heart and life. There is no, there is no life that is so perfected that God can't change something in your life. Let him change you. And the last thing I want to say is let Jesus be the gift that you both give and receive this Christmas season. It's so important that we don't lose the focus with the gift buying and the putting up decorations and the uh, entertaining and the cooking and all the other practical stuff that's going to happen this Christmas season. Give the gift of eternal life by sharing Jesus with someone, reminding them that he loves them having those conversations and loving people in a practical way and hosting them in your home, make sure that you have shared Jesus with your loved ones this Christmas season because they need it. As much as you and I need it, they need it all the more. So let's take a moment and let's pray, both for those um, that need to meet him for the first time 
and for those that have been walking with him faithfully for 30 years, uh, let's, let's pray together. And I want you to uh, think of someone that you can be praying for this week for them to come to know him like we know him. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love for us and for how, not just how you fulfilled prophecies because it's amazing, because it is, but that you did all of these things for us on our behalf because we couldn't do them. Lord Jesus, we pray for our loved ones that have not met you in faith yet, who've been around you, who've heard of you, who've seen you active and alive in people. We pray for, for each one and we pray for them to come to the moment where they pray a simple prayer of faith. And Jesus, we're gonna, we're gonna pray that prayer together with the hope that, that our loved ones, the ones that we care for, the ones that we would lay down our lives for, that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior today. And so we, we ask Jesus that they would pray. They would pray, Lord Jesus, I want to know you. By faith, save me. I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. I'm so grateful for your love for me. Make me your child this day. May this Christmas be the, the first Christmas I have with you as Lord and King. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I know that this uh, time of the year can also stir up so many emotions, especially for some uh, that are grieving loss of loved ones and difficulty and uh, job difficulty and all of that stuff. So we're going to put on a, I'm going to have uh, a worship song on in the background. And if you'd like prayer for anything... Uh, we're going to do our closing blessing, and so uh, our blessing comes out of the gospel in Jude. Jude 24, and there's only one chapter. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Have a wonderful and blessed Sunday, and I hope to see all of you next door for the potluck. Take care, and God bless.